Hey everybody, it is Trey here. I'm joined again by Sean, and we are here with reactions to the classics, man. We are going to break down David Bowie's seminal record, Hunky Dory. This is the first time we ever listened to David Bowie. I yes. mean, we knew a song here or there, some of the bigger hits, but uh, not, not too much. So, diving in today, and if this is your first time joining us, man, Thanks for stopping by. Here are reactions to the classics. We react to some of the most classic albums of all time. Break them down track by track. A lot of the times it's our first time listening to it. So if that sounds like something interesting to you, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button. And we appreciate that. And of course, we can't play the full studio versions of the song. So we got some live performances in there and all that good stuff. But uh, enough of the upfront stuff. Let's get into some fourth facts, Sean. Well, Trey, this is Bowie's fourth studio album. It was released in December of 1971. And this thing's a number 107 on the Rolling Stones' 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. A little interesting fact about this album, when he started recording it in June of 71, he didn't have a record deal anymore. His first three, <laughs> first three albums weren't real successful. RCA uh, in New York, in New York subsidiary of it, ended up signing him in September of 71, and then obviously the album came out mm -hmm. in December of 71. Yeah, and it's interesting too that this thing wasn't like a huge commercial success whenever no. it was released either. And I, I guess kind of having that new record deal, maybe, you know, he didn't have like a huge following like he did, of course, in the decades that followed. But once he got uh, really popular with Ziggy Stardust, this album, Hunky Dory, came back, reached number three on the charts and stayed there for 69 weeks. And Bowie himself said that this was one of his favorite records of his entire career. And, uh, you know, I can see why, because it kind of jump-started him to... Uh, the other successes he had. All right, Trevor, we're going to kick this thing off with Changes, one of his most famous songs of, of all time. It's number 128 mm -hmm. on the Rolling Stone Top 500 Songs of All Time. It's in the Grammy Hall of Fame. It was uh, included in the 500 songs that shaped rock and roll. So this thing is a huge hit. However, it was released as a single in the U.S., and it didn't even chart. Yeah, that's crazy because it is such a... A great song, one of my favorites on the entire record, oh, yeah. probably my favorite. Uh, it just kind of kicks off the entire record where you hear, you know, the dun dun, and then we kind of get going into it, and then the chorus ch 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 changes, you know. I, I really dug it, and, um, you know, this is actually the, the last song he performed live in 2000. Yeah. And, in six and it kind of just talks about of course just the changes in life almost a reflection of Bowie himself throughout the 70s with his different yeah. different personas and whatnot so uh, it's kind of a you know probably something that was within him there and uh, projected that out and people couldn't you know kind of interpret it however they want in their own lives but all in all man I thought this was a, a great way to open the album and uh, an amazing song then we go into Oh You Pretty Things. This kind of starts off nice and mellow yeah. uh, with the piano, and then the, the chorus comes in, and we get the, all the full instrumentation. We get booming, and I, I really dug this one into kind of a, a, a different type of song musically, but uh, I, I like the chorus of it, and uh, even if the lyrics were a little funky. Yeah, the lyrics are a little funky because when you dig into the lyrics, uh, Bowie had this fascination with the occult and uh, Aleister Crowley to be in particular mm -hmm. one of the most famous Brits uh, and, and occultist back at the turn of the century up into the early 30s. Also uh, Nitschke, a philosopher that he, he shared some similar thoughts with um, vocally I think one of his best performances no, on the I, album. I'd agree on that. really you know showed off his range. Yeah and that's gonna take us right into the third song mm -hmm. which uh, is, is pretty much uh, self-explanatory. It's yeah. an eight-line poem, and guess what? There's eight lines. There's, that's it. And the song lasts over three minutes. There's eight lines. It's fine. Yeah, I it's mean. kind of taking uh, taken the perspective of a cactus. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it was just kind of basic. Can't make this stuff up. Yeah, it's kind of basic and uh, just pretty, you know, nothing too crazy about it. A little bit forgettable for me. Then we get into one of his most famous songs, Life yeah. on Mars, and this thing was a banger, man. I really, really enjoyed this. This was released a couple years after this album as a single, and uh, in 2012, in a poll of Bowie's best songs of all time, it was voted number one, so that yeah. should tell you something uh, with his large discography, and it's, uh, uh, Bowie described this as kind of a young girl's reaction to the media, 
She's a sensitive girl. She knows that there's a, another world out there for her, but she's sad she can't get access to it. I thought the piano backing here, uh, going into Bo uh, Bowie's big vocals on the chorus, the life on Mars, you know, yeah. it's pretty yeah. powerful. And I would put this right behind Changes for me as my favorite song on the album. Very interesting on this song. Uh, in 1967, Bowie uh, wrote a song called Even a Fool Learns to Love. And he, he put that the lyrics to a 1967 French song that I can't pronounce because yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not French and don't speak French, but uh, it was never released. So then Paul Anka, famous songwriter in America, buys the rights to this French song and writes the song My Way by Frank Sinatra, which becomes mm -hmm. a huge hit yeah. for Old Blue Eyes in 1969. Well, Bowie writes Life on Mars as a parody to Frank's song, which I don't know if I would have taunted Frank Sinatra. He has repeatedly a little bit of uh, ties to uh, some people you don't really uh, want to cross, but uh, he wrote it as a parody to him. And even in the liner notes in this album for this song, he said, uh, inspired by Frankie. So very interesting. <laughs> then we go into track number five, Kooks. Yeah. And Bowie wrote this for the birth of his son. It was kind of inspired by uh, Neil Young. This is one of my least favorites on the album. If I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, my mom's heard this record. This is her favorite on the album. It so is, it just yeah. shows you how there could be difference. But to me, man, I just, I don't know. It may, I think it was something in his vocal delivery that was a little bit funky to me. And I just wasn't a huge fan of this. You know, I didn't mind it. It mm -hmm. is definitely different. It's a lighthearted fair. I actually did kind of like it, you know, mm -hmm. the lyrics of it. He's basically asking his son as he, He's writing it to his son as his son ages, saying, you know, hang around with me and your mom. We're kooks. You're going to find out we're a little weird, but we're on your side. We're all mm -hmm. in this together. Um, favorite line from the song, basically, if your homework's getting you down, don't worry. We'll throw it on the fire, yeah. get in the car, and go downtown. So there you go. Yeah, I, I, I do like the, the message behind it. Yeah. yeah. All right, then we go into track number six, Quicksand. And for me, man, this was my least favorite track. Uh, I don't know. I just it, there was a bunch of acoustic behind it, yeah. but it just didn't change much. It went a little long for my taste. This kind of deal deals lyrically with uh, occultism, Nitschke's concept of the Superman, some Buddhism thrown in here. So you got some foreign, you know, kind of uh, interesting ideas that Bowie was dabbling with at the time, and just yeah. as a whole, it just didn't do much for me. Yeah, and you know that's it for me I, mm -hmm. lyrically you know i'm big on lyrics like i actually think it's his strongest vocal performance on here or right up there i mean obviously changes is, is in there too vocally uh my issue is with the lyrics it's mm -hmm. kind of hard for me to get past because of the occultism yeah. uh, talks about the uh cult for better lack of it of golden dawn that crowley was a member of initially actually learned that churchill was and i went down this yeah. whole rabbit hole learning, <laughs> learning a lot of stuff uh, about that but you know the song is basically about don't worry about the afterlife you know live your life now and so yeah i wasn't feeling it but but vocally he's mm -hmm. really strong on this song all right and that brings us to the b side mm -hmm. first songs fill your heart it's actually a follow-up to the previous song quicksand basically saying don't worry about anything just love mm -hmm. and and that that's basically what it's about it's fine for me yeah for me this was better than the previous two so started for me going the album back up hell a little yeah. bit still wasn't one of my favorites i thought it was still a little bit forgettable but uh we kind of started the momentum going and um you know it, it was fine and then we go from that basic kind of, you know, upbeat love yeah. song into something that we get some electronic tones in here. with and just and a way different kind of yeah, song. Yeah, Andy Warhol. And it was a, a kind of a, a weird song. Like, I mean, yeah. it's named Andy Warhol. But this was probably my third favorite song in the entire record. I thought it was a great bounce back from the previous few tracks and, uh, you know, kind of put Bowie's creativity back up right. into, you know, instrumentally and everything. And uh, I, I just thought it was great going into the uh, just the chorus, Andy Warhol, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I dug it, man. Yeah, this song stuck in my head. It's a really good song. It's really odd, as you said, but I mean, if you're watching this video and you're a Bowie fan, you realize yeah. <laughs> David was a little odd. I mean, that was part of his genius. And so I think in this, Andy Warhol didn't even know who he was. He sent an advanced copy mm -hmm. of this to him and then was able to perform it for Warhol at Warhol's club before this was released. And he never knew if Warhol liked it or not, because Warhol, was, he didn't react to anything. Yeah, he's just like, yeah. So he just, he didn't know. But uh, yeah, I thought it was really good. 
All right, Trey, now we're up to song for Bob Dylan. We just had Andy Warhol, uh, who was a personal hero of Bowie, wrote it as a tribute. Mm -hmm. This song, however, is a parody of Dylan's 1962 song for Woody Guthrie, except for in this song, Bowie doesn't refer to him as Bob Dylan, he refers to him as Robert Zimmerman, and speaks of Dylan in like in the third person. Uh, so I don't think this was a tribute. I think it was kind of a shot at Dylan, and I love Bob Dylan, yeah. as you know. It's a little hard for me to get over, but it's a great song, actually. He, re he refers to Dylan's voice like sand and glue. Um, but, you know, it's a really good song. I just, I got to get over the fact that I love Bob Dylan, <laughs> yeah. and I think it's a shot at him. Yeah, and in a 1976 interview, Bowie actually said it's the inspiration behind the song was, you know, Dylan at this time, when the album was released, was in a motorcycle accident, had been out of the limelight yeah, for, for five years, for a little while. So it was a, a leadership void in rock and roll, and Bowie said, I'm going to step up and take it. I kind of see this in the middle uh, of being a, a, a tribute and also kind of a shot. I think that Bowie had respect for Dylan um, and he was almost challenging him because he knew how good Dylan was to yeah. come out, man, you can do this, but in the saying that, you know, he was taking shots at him. So I kind of saw it as a middle ground here and uh, all that to say, I thought it was a really good song. Love the instrumentation and vocals behind it and uh, I, I thought it was good. Then we go into the second to last song on this record, a tribute to the Velvet Underground and a hero of David Bowie's Lou Reed, yes. Queen Bitch. And it had a good understated vocal performance by yes. Bowie here, I thought. I really enjoyed this and it kind of uh, was a precursor to a couple of his uh, following albums in the glam rock style. Yeah, it really brought that in and Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars is going to be coming really about six or seven months after mm -hmm. this and it kind of provided that template for it. Uh, most of the lyric analysis will tell you it could be about a transvestite, a cross-dresser, uh, or who knows, yeah. but it definitely did bring in the glam rock that, mm -hmm. that David was going to take to an entirely different level that no one could have imagined yeah. at this time. <laughs> All right, Trevor, to the last track, The Buley Brothers, and this song meant something to David because in the late 70s, he named his publishing company The Buley Brothers. Mm -hmm. Later on, he commented that it was about his uh, half-brother who was schizophrenic named yeah. Terry, so yeah. whenever you kind of go through it with that lens, I think the song takes a much bigger meaning it did for me at me least. Me too. I think it makes um, it really, really good. Uh, Others have said it has homosexual overtones. I don't really see that in there too much. I don't much. see that either. Uh, and the interesting thing was Bowie only performed this a handful of times and all the way in the 2000s. So he never really performed it live in the time the frame that Hunky Dory was released. But overall, I thought this was a really good kind of laid back track. And uh, at the end, you kind of get into some uh, almost like creepy like voices and yeah. whatnot. And that's where I think it lends a little credence to maybe the schizophrenia was in there a little bit. Well, and I think it might lend to that also since he didn't perform it live. Yeah. Any other song you probably would, but if it had that high of a personal feeling yeah, for connection him, to yeah, him. it may be difficult to perform live. But yeah, I thought it was a really strong way to end the album. Mm -hmm, me too. And I guess that'll take us right into our favorite tracks. Yeah. Uh, we kind of already touched on this, but for me, Changes Man, that's one of my favorite songs we've heard since we've been doing this channel. And Life on Mars and Andy Warhol, those would be the top three for me. And uh, Beauty Brothers would probably be fourth. I'll agree with that, although for you, I know Changes is number one for me, Life on yeah. Mars, but you could flip that however you wanted it. What'd you give the overall album? I went with a solid 8.0 out of 10, man. This is, a, a, I'd say, a very, very good record. It had a couple misses for me in the middle, but they all happened right in a row. Yeah. So uh, the book ends of the album, the first, you know, few tracks at the start and then the last like you know four or five tracks at the end of the album i all thought were uh, really good to great with some absolute classics in there and uh so overall pretty good record yeah i gave it a 775 and i agree with you a really good record definitely worth a listen or two mm -hmm. or three and and i think it's bowie in some ways at his purest mm -hmm. yeah i'd agree with that and uh i guess that will wrap it up from yeah. us today man so uh, if you enjoyed this be sure to comment below let us know what you think about hunky dory what your favorite track is on this record and uh, like i said earlier be sure to hit that big red subscribe button we upload at least twice a week a variety of genres from some of the biggest names in music history i'm sure there's going to be something on there for everybody but uh until next time, happy listening, my friends, and we will see you.